Good afternoon, and thanks to everybody who has joined us for our Faith and Facts Friday's discussion with Dr. Fauci. Thousands of individuals from across the Commonwealth have registered for today's event, and we are so happy that you have taken time out of your busy schedules to hear from our leadership today. I am Sable K. Nelson Dyer, Acting Director of the Virginia Department of Health, Office of Health Equity, and Chair of the Virginia Emergency Port Team's Health Equity Working Group. The Health Equity Working Group is the first equity mechanism established within a Virginia Unified Command for a state emergency incident, and it's what connected Dr. Janice Underwood, the first cabinet-level diversity, equity, and inclusion officer, Dr. Robert Wynn, the director of the VCU Massey Center, and myself. And you'll be hearing from both Dr. Underwood and Dr. Wynn shortly, but it's because of the synergy of these great and dynamic leaders across the country, um, excuse me, across the Commonwealth, that brought one of our late, our nation's leaders in infectious disease to speak to you today. Before we formally begin, I would like to share with you a few housekeeping items. First of all, I want to let you know that this event is being held primarily via Zoom, but it's also being simulcast on Facebook Live on the Facebook pages of the Commonwealth of Virginia's Governor, Ralph S. Northam, the Virginia Department of Health, as well as the BCU Massey Cancer Center. There are also a few national and local media outlets who are streaming the event as well. And just wanting to thank our partners for their continued support. Secondly, would like to make you all aware of the several accommodations that we have made for today's event. The first accommodation that I would like to let you know about is American Sign Language. Wanting to thank our two sign language interpreters, Elaine Hernandez and Bernice McCormack um, for their services today. Those individuals will be pinned and to your screen, so you should be able to see which of, which of the two of them who are providing those services for you all. Um, and you should be able to look at them and be able to see them whether you're joining through the Facebook Live or through the, or via Zoom. The second accommodation I would like to tell you about is Virginia Relay Remote Co Conference Captioning. Um, we want to thank them for providing the captioning services today. To access RCC, you must use a link to view the captions. The link will be shared for those who are participating via Zoom in the chat box, and you all will be able to look at the um, captioning for the event. And for those of you who, of a, who are joining via Facebook, um, the link for the RCC closed captioning is available on the VDH Office of Health Equity Facebook page. Wanting to let you know that um, we are encouraging our simulcast streaming partners to share the RCC link on their respective Facebook pages so we can ensure the accessibility for as many of those um, who may need that specific accommodation. Also wanting to let individuals know that we have Spanish interpretation. Um, thank you to Maria Ayoso um, for providing Spanish interpretation services today. Um, for those who need the Spanish language translation, you must be joining us via, the, via Zoom. Um, and the, the ability to do that um, has been shared on the VDH uh, website. Um, and we will be providing, um, after our chat today, um, we will be providing the, um, tele the recordings, both in English and in Spanish, as well as the captioning. And those will be posted onto the VDH website. That's a reminder that this meeting is being recorded and we are looking forward to you sharing the recording with your network. Also wanting to let you know, and just a little bit in terms of how this time will be structured today, this is gonna be a virtual meeting in two parts. We have a packed agenda overflowing with experts and Virginia-based all-stars for today's discussion. Part one is going to be the discussion with Dr. Fauci, um, and he will be answering questions from Dr. Wynn um, that were submitted to individuals. The over 8,000 folks who um, registered to participate ahead of time will be sharing some of those questions with Dr. Fauci. And then the second part is going to be an all-star panel of Virginia-based subject matter experts who will be answering questions specifically about the COVID vaccine and the deployment of the COVID vaccine here in the Commonwealth. And finally, i um, wanting to let everyone know that we want this to be an interactive session. Um, we have already 95 questions that have been put into our Q&A box. 
And we have an incredible team of subject matter experts who have been um, assembled to answer questions um, from our DDH vaccine unit. So please feel free to ask those questions. Thank you to our vaccination unit team members for answering those questions in real time. And for those of you all who are joining through one of the Facebook mechanisms, there are um, mechanisms under, so those questions can be forwarded to our vaccination unit to be incorporated in our FAQs. So with that being said, welcome again. And I'm going to turn things over to Mrs. Rudine Mercer Haynes, um, one of the advisors to the Faith and Facts Friday group to provide our charge and purpose. Mrs. Mercer Haynes, are you there? Yes, thank you so much, Sable Kay. Um, for many of you who don't know me, again, my name is Rudine Haynes, and I'm a partner at Hunt and Andrews Kurth based here in Richmond. And I feel like I have a calling to serve my community the best way that I can. I've been tasked today with giving our charge and purpose for today's program. As many of you know, Dr. Wynn, Pastor Gray, and, and I convened the Facts and Faith Friday calls to build and cultivate a bridge of trust between the medical community and the Black faith community. This was especially important given our justified skepticism based on our collective history. Recognizing the disparate impact of COVID-19 on people of color, and in particular Black and Latinx communities, Dr. Wynn, Pastor Gray, and I considered it absolutely imperative to disseminate credible, and I mean credible, fact-based fact and medically sound information regarding this deadly virus to our Black faith leaders and their congrega congregations. We are thankful of the efforts of our faithful Richmond Concerned Black clergy, Governor Northam, the Virginia Department of Health, the VU VCU Health System, State Senator Jennifer McClellan, and Mayor Stoney among others in being supportive of our mission. And we are incredibly excited to have Dr. Fauci with us today to continue to build upon that bridge of trust that we hope that, that we hope to create the inception of these Facts and Faith Friday calls. As we all know, Dr. Fauci has spoken and continues to speak truth to power in using his voice and his platform to emphasize the seriousness of this deadly pandemic. And we look forward to hearing Dr. Fauci's thoughts and some of our other Virginia-based leaders on the road ahead with the rollout of the COVID vaccinations. Thank you so much. And I turn it over to Pastor F. Todd Gray to open us up in prayer. Shall we bow? Our Lord and our God, as ever, we magnify your name. We thank you for this opportunity that we might gather like this to be fully informed of those things which will bless our congregations. We thank you for those that have made this call possible. We thank you for our medical community that continues to advise us and minister to us that we might be healthy and that we might get through this pandemic. We thank you for the scientific community that are using their gifts that they might come up with vaccines and other medical techniques to assuage the effects of this coronavirus. I thank you for those that have been part of this call since its inception. I thank you for Dr. Wien. I thank you for Rudine, who have coordinated these efforts and helped us to more effectively and intelligently minister to our congregation. We pray that through our efforts together that we would be made more informed, that we would be more effective, even as we try to bless our community. And all these things we lift up before you, we pray that you would bless it, that your purpose would be advanced and that your people would be enhanced. In the name of the master, I pray, amen. Amen. Well, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Janice Underwood, and I serve as Virginia's Chief Diversity Officer to Governor Ralph Northam, the first codified cabinet level position of its kind in the Commonwealth and to exist nationally. Welcome to an expanded Faith and Facts Friday, where the Faith and Facts Friday group have opened their doors to all Virginians. The Governor's Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion is honored to bring this event to the Commonwealth in partnership with the Office of Health Equity at the Virginia Department of Health and the VCU Massey Cancer Center. This statewide conversation is so important, more now than ever as Virginia comes together 
in support of our One Virginia mission during this public health crisis, which might I add, has been further complicated by structural racism in our political landscape, including and especially after the events of January 6. We want everyone to know that Virginia is committed to being part of the national dialogue toward unity, healing, and reconciliation. The Governor's Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and the State Health Equity Working Group have been on the front line since the first week of March 2020 to address the disparate impact of this disease on underserved communities. With so much disparity across many communities, we know we must build trust and ensure equitable access to the COVID-19 vaccine for everyone. These are very important and difficult conversations. And the Northam administration is committed to having them with every Virginian to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. So often we hear that diverse communities don't trust government, healthcare and law enforcement. Well, in Virginia, we understand that. And we know there are historical reasons for this justifiable mistrust. And therefore we are shifting this narrative to include, we are doing the work to earn the trust of all communities, especially those who have been harmed throughout history. Our health equity task force and working group, the first of its kind in the nation has captured critical data needed to inform the Virginia's unified command about at-risk populations and how to thread equity in all decision-making. We've leveraged a data-driven process in the distribution of masks, hand sanitizer, community testing and public health information in coordination with the Virginia Department of Health. Governor Northam designated millions for small business relief, rent and mortgage relief, support to our pre-K 16 partners, and so much more, because we know that it takes all of us working together to build back better after such a difficult year our state and country have faced. For example, together, the health equity and vaccine working groups stood in partnership with all communities to hold important town halls that reached over 100,000 Virginia residents, like our faith leaders webinar in April, the racial equity and law enforcement town hall and our interfaith prayer vigil over the summer and dozens of vaccine related town halls just a few weeks ago representing all geographical areas of the Commonwealth to have important conversations like the one we're gathered here for today with Dr. Anthony Fauci, the nation's most trusted expert on infectious diseases. So much planning has gone into making this event a success so that we can bring you accurate information about the vaccine from the most trusted sources, dispel myths and earn your trust. So please enjoy today's conversation. And in the meantime, thank you, Virginia, for all the sacrifices you've made to get us to this moment. Together, we will get through this crisis. In the meantime, wash your hands often, wear a mask, stay home if and or when you can, and please only get your information from trusted sources like the CDC, your care provider, the Virginia Departments of Health and Emergency Management, the governor's office, and yes, Dr. Fauci. We know there are already many fraudulent vaccine scams going on. So please be on guard because there are folks out there that will attempt to use this moment for their personal gain. So let's jump in and have a great conversation. If you're ready, let's go. I have the distinct honor of introducing our next speaker, Governor Ralph Northam. During a particularly difficult moment in our history, Governor Northam brings his experience as a doctor, a business owner, state senator, and former Lieutenant Governor to this historic time in the Commonwealth. Might I add, we are the only state to enjoy the leadership of a doctor during a public health crisis in the governor's office. Governor Ralph Northam, the 73rd Governor of Virginia, has a heart for all people, especially those who have been historically marginalized and underrepresented. And it is this love for all Virginians in particular that guides every decision he makes. Please welcome the 73rd Governor, Governor Ralph Northam. Well, good afternoon. And thank you so much, Dr. Underwood, for 
that kind introduction. I, I hope all of you are safe and healthy. You know, this is an exciting day for a couple of reasons. First of all, Dr. Anthony Fauci is a friend and health expert who we have all come to know and trust. And we are so excited that he's here with us today. And I'm looking forward to talking and hearing more about the vaccine. Finally, there is hope and light at the end of a long, dark tunnel. I want to thank everyone involved in this event today, the Faith and Facts Friday group, and Dr. Robert Wynn, a member of our state's health equity working group, and the director of the VCU Massey Cancer Center. He is the only African-American director of an NCI designated cancer center in the entire nation. And we are so grateful to have his leadership right here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. I also want to welcome Dr. President Rao from VCU. Thank you so much for your leadership and your friendship. Dr. Underwood, our Commonwealth's Chief Diversity Officer, members of our Office Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and the Department of Health's Office of Health Equity, to Congressman Bobby Scott and other elected officials and all the faith and community leaders who are with us this afternoon. This has definitely been, as Dr. Underwood said, a team effort and we're proud of our team here in Virginia. And again, I want to thank and welcome Dr. Fauci for joining us today. Dr. Fauci, I just wanted you to know to honor you, I have my own Dr. Fauci face mask. As a doctor myself, I have been so grateful to Dr. Fauci for his steady science-based factual leadership during this pandemic. You know, it has been a long and difficult 10 months for everyone. The COVID-19 pandemic has literally turned all of our lives upside down. Thousands of Virginians and Americans have lost their lives. Many more have lost jobs and livelihoods, businesses that they built and even more. Many don't know if and where their next meal is coming from. Children and their families have suffered and everyone has suffered from the isolation fear, and uncertainty. The development of vaccines against this virus are a marvel of science and international cooperation. It is nothing short of amazing that we have these vaccines in such a short period of time. I wanna be clear that while the vaccines have been developed qu quickly, that is because the smartest and most talented scientists have worked around the clock and because governments have reduced red tape. No one has cut any corners. Vaccines do not give you the disease. Instead, they spur your body to produce antibodies to the disease. As a matter of fact, this vaccine does not use a live or attenuated virus. You will not get COVID from the vaccine. Scientists, know how to create vaccines that work and are safe. So I have no hesitation about taking this vaccine when my turn comes. And I hope everyone watching today will do the same and urge their friends and family to get vaccinated too. That is our only real way out of this pandemic. We must get a large majority of the population vaccinated, and the sooner, the better. Now, I know the news reports say that the vaccine rollout hasn't gone as quickly as planned, but both here in Virginia and nationally. But this is also the biggest vaccination program we have seen in our lifetimes. We have two vaccines now, with more expected later, and both need to be kept cold. The logistics are incredibly complex, and so are the sheer numbers. Right now, Virginia is getting about 110,000 doses of vaccine a week.
between the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. But we have 8.5 million people and both of those vaccines require two doses spaced out. Now, we expect to see our weekly vaccine allocation ramp up as production increases. This week, I announced an initial goal of 25,000 vaccinations a day, and we expect to increase that goal as we get more supply. As you know, I've put Richmond Henrico Health Director Danny, Dr. Danny Avula in charge of coordinating all of these. And I've urged our vaccinators to get vaccine into arms as fast as they can. But it's still going to take some time to get everyone who wants the vaccine. We're committed to getting there as expeditiously and equitably as possible. And I hope the majority of Virginians will get vaccinated. The vaccine is the way to stop this virus. It's our path forward to recovery and it's the clearest way we're going to get back to something that feels like normal. I hope our faith leaders and all faiths and all of the community leaders who are on today will be strong partners in this effort. You are trusted leaders in your communities and you can be a huge help in getting the word out that vaccines are safe and that people should take them. I know that many people are wary because of the vaccine, because of the past racist experiments and medical practices done on our two people of color. I understand that. I can't change the past, but I can say that we are working hard to earn trust in diverse communities. And we do that by listening to our residents and getting facts and information on these vaccines to people in all communities, especially communities with justifiable mistrust to help answer questions and give reassurance that the vaccine is safe to take. We need everyone's help in this effort. So I am so excited to hear from Dr. Fauci today and I know all of you are too. I'm again so grateful for his leadership these past months and I'm glad He's going to continue his wonderful work in the new Biden administration to lead in our recovery. Dr. Fauci, thank you for making the time to join us today and welcome to the Commonwealth of Virginia. And thanks again to VCU and our Health Equity Working Group for making this event possible. Happy New Year and stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Governor Northam, so much for your remarks. And we will now um, transition to hear from our next speaker, um, President um, Rao, who will be introducing um, Dr. Wynn. President Rao, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Okay. Governor Northam, thank you very much for all of those kind words and thank you for your continued partnership with all of us. Um, I'm also pleased to join in here and welcome Dr. Fauci. Um, I, I'd like to say director of our National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, but he's really become more of an icon of uh, national, our National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. Um, what an incredible experience and, and calming voice that we've all uh, really appreciated, just as we did when he provided so much leadership and, and lots of factual and, and very helpful information uh, through the HIV AIDS crisis. Um, a lot of people don't remember that, but it was an important time. Um, he's kept us well informed and advised uh, in a time with events and circumstances that are really um, have been and will continue to be probably unpredictable and certainly unprecedented. Um, it's an honor to have you, Dr. Fauci. Um, we, uh, this is a long way from when you delivered uh, people's prescriptions from your, your parents' pharmacy, but uh, we're, we're delighted that you're here and delighted that you're uh, a part of, of uh, this, uh, this important discussion. 
Um, I have the honor of introducing um, my colleague, who's really my key partner here at VCU. Um, he is the director of VCU's Massey Cancer Center. Um, I'm so proud of him. Um, he's here for all of our patients. I can certainly say that. And when I say that, he's really here for our community. And, and that's what a university that like VCU, that is a, it's a safety net hospital. It is a major research university that takes great pride in its commitment to access for anyone who can benefit from this major research university. Um, it's connecting to our communities. That's what people really want. Um, the other thing that we all have to remain aware of is that we're educating the next generation of, of providers in healthcare and in many other fields. And I have to tell you that connecting people to their communities is going to be really, really important. So um, beyond COVID, um, uh, more people are dying from cancer because they're not getting the care they need. Um, I think it is fair to say that uh, more people of color are dying. Um, once again, uh, disproportionately because they're not getting the care that they need. There's not a lot of, of, of information um, that, that they have about the extent to which uh, what they're dealing with in the context of cancer or cardiovascular disease or really even so many of the other issues that, that people face with metabolic disorders. Um, how serious is that versus COVID? Well, pretty serious and we're seeing that in the number of people who are dying. And, and it, 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 I literally choke when I say that because it, it's, it's, it's so hurt, hurtful to all of us because we live to, to keep people alive. And in Rob's leadership, he continues to, to think about um, uh, everybody with cancer and, and, and how we need to, to reach and, and treat our patients in new ways. So we've, we've certainly made great, pro great progress with telehealth and i um, very proud of, of, of Rob and all of my colleagues at VCU's Massey Cancer Center. Um, Rob is really um, our lead to uh, the uh, National Institutes of Health, uh, National Cancer Institute comprehensive status that, that is so important to our ability to, to really expand in the care that we provide so many people here in the Commonwealth. Um, we've got to find ways to serve all of our patients and we've got to eliminate health disparities and trust is the most important way to do that and connecting to our communities with that trust is, is really key to that. So uh, Rob, um, it's my honor to introduce you and I know you will give a more proper introduction to uh, Dr. Uh, Fauci. Bye. Thank you guys. Uh, and thank you, President Rao. Um, I have to say that if it's okay with you, Dr. Fauci, uh, we've come to agreement that we would like to rename um, this day from Facts uh, Faith Friday to Facts Faith Fauci Friday, if that's okay with you, sir. Um, I think that we're really all excited about your being here. And we really do believe that this is an effort of human will and science. And in fact, like the governor, I too have a mask that really, if you could see this says, uh, at the end of the day, science will triumph. And I believe that. Um, I wanna start off by thanking uh, the great people of the Commonwealth, the men and women who show bravery every day, showing up to work in our grocery stores and in our ICUs. I also wanna thank Governor Northam uh, for his strong leadership during really very difficult times. And I know it can't be easy to be a governor because he's had to make some unpopular decisions, but those unpopular decisions have, I believe, saved hundreds if not thousands of lives in the Commonwealth. I'd also like to thank members of his team, Dr. Janice Underwood, uh, Sable K. Nelson, who uh, from the health disparities perspective have kept the light and have shown that light uh, without fail and without wavering, as well as Dr. Norm Oliver, uh, the Commissioner of Health in Virginia, um, who's just been a great partner, as well as uh, Dr. Kerry, who's our Secretary of Health and Human Services here um, in the state of Virginia. I'd be remiss if I left out folks like Danny Avula, uh, Mayor LaVar Stoney, um, Delegate um, Dolores McQuinn, uh, Representative um, uh, State Senator McQuellen, as well as the entire Black Caucus, who from time to time actually really were um, the group that um, stiffened my spine to find the courage at times when my knees were weak 
and sort of making statements and, and, and making sure that our people and our communities were safe. I can't go another moment without thanking uh, President Michael Rao, uh, who I still will brag on him no matter whenever I get a chance, because I do believe that he is one of the, the top university presidents in the country and one of the few that I know that believes that uh, the generation of new knowledge and science and creation of new drugs is important, but that if these things aren't impacting the community, then it's of little value. So I wanna thank you, President Rao. I also wanna thank Vice President and Executive CEO Art Kellerman, who has brought a level of just not only energy, but really is our moral uh, compass, our North Star, if you will, about doing good in the community. And Peter Buckley, who's the Dean of the College of Medicine, uh, for their continued support of my not only bringing forth and developing new science, but they have been uh, as equally supportive of my engaging the community for their health. And I don't take that for granted, that their push for me to, to develop new science, but their push for me to have that science impact the community is something that I really value. My other colleagues, Dr. Kevin Harris, uh, Dr. Catherine Tosis, Dr. Uh, Vanessa Shepard, uh, Cheryl Garland, uh, I want to just thank them for just their continued uh, everyday support since this thing began. Um, but most of all, I really want to thank Pastor Gray, Sister Rudine, and all the members of the Facts Faith Friday group <clears throat> for allowing me to have a front row seat in understanding what true courage commitment to truth and community and grace looks like. In fact, at moments when I've become weak and very frustrated, they remain my beacon of light and hope. One example of that grace is what we're doing right now. The original plans, Dr. Fauci, were to have you meet with probably several hundred of us that typically meet every week, and we've been meeting every week since March. It was this group, the Facts, Faith, and Friday group, that felt compelled to open this up because they believe that as we look at communities that you, sir, actually are also a beacon of truth and array of light for all of us. And they believe that it was important, yes, that you share this moment with us, but that they share with many others. That example moved me in a way in which I couldn't deny. And I reached out as soon as I could and, and you know, to Dr. Underwood, Norm Oliver, Secretary uh, Kerry, and said we should partner. And thank goodness we've actually had this partnership. I wanna tell you that you've meant a lot to probably more people than you know, and we can certainly talk about uh, your career, your esteemed career as an early researcher, your appointment in 1984 to the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease, we can certainly talk about your extensive research and your extensive impact on not only just HIV AIDS, uh, not only in the United States, but globally, but the impact you've had on other diseases, tuberculosis, malaria, Ebola, and, and, Zika, and Zika. Importantly, you've actually served and advised six presidents <laughs> with the HIV AIDS, as well as many other domestic and global health issues. And you were the principal architect of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, a program that has really saved millions uh, throughout the developing world and actually in some of our poor neighborhoods even here. Dr. Fauci, we just wanted to let you know how appreciative we are that you are here and that for many of us, you have demonstrated the courage, the commitment to truth and a level of grace that serves as a role model for all of us. And again, in my trying times, the times when I've gotten weak, the times when I've second guessed, the times when I've been frustrated. So we've looked to you again as that ray of hope uh, and that shining light of strength. And I just wanted to say thank you from the Facts Faith Friday group, from Pastor Gray, from Sister Rudine, and from all of us from the Facts Faith Friday, from the university and from the state of Virginia, we welcome you 
And I'm going to yield the floor because I know that I, they're not here to hear me, sir, but they are here to hear you. But I just want to give my two cents about how much we respect and trust you, not only in an African-American community, but well beyond and have admired your commitment, your courage, uh, and certainly your focus and commitment on truth. So thank you. The next voice you hear will be that of Dr. Anthony Fauci. Thank you very much, Dr. Wynn. Uh, and thank you, Governor Northam and President Rao. It's really a, a great pleasure to be here with you today to talk to you about COVID-19 vaccines, our progress and priorities. I'm going to give a little bit of a background of why I feel it's so important to, for people to get vaccinated, particularly brown and, and black people, because of the reasons that I'm going to be talking about in my presentation. And then I would obviously be happy to answer some questions afterwards. But let's take a look at the scope of the problem. As of yesterday, there are now close to 90 million cases of COVID-19 worldwide with almost 2 million deaths. This now as a global pandemic is the worst that the world has seen in 102 years since the infamous pandemic of 1918. Unfortunately for us here in the United States, we are the worst hit country in the world with over 20 million cases and close to 360,000 deaths. If one looks at this virtually every day, particularly now, as we're in the cold season where people do things indoors, where we're just coming off the travel and the congregating in social settings of the holiday season, virtually every day, another record is broke. Just yesterday, a record for deaths in a given day, 4,111 deaths occurred in the United States due to COVID-19. There were 280,000 new cases and over 150,000 hospitalizations. If one looks at the surges of cases, we can see that right now on the right-hand part of the slide in the late fall, the slope of the curve of increased cases on a daily basis show you that in the early spring, when the cases were dominated by the Northeast, particularly the metropolitan area of New York, then in early summer, as we try to open up the country because of the economic considerations, and then now, look how sharp that increase is leading to the record numbers that I mentioned just a bit ago. One of the extraordinary aspects of this pandemic is the racial and ethnic disparities with the most pervasive being observed in black and brown people, African-Americans, Latino and Latina, American Indians, Alaskan Natives and Pacific Islanders. Now, one needs to look at why this is the case. There's a, what I call the binary nature of COVID-19 health disparities along racial and ethnic lines. There's an increased incidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection in minority populations, and there's a predisposition to severe disease once you get infected. So let's take a look at why is there an increased incidence if one looks at the in general, and there's always dangerous to generalize, but here I think it's informative because in general, when you look at the occupations and living conditions of black and brown people, it often puts them in a situation out in the community, not generally having the opportunity to carry out their work looking at a computer screen the way I'm doing right now, but it often puts them in a position to have to interact outside in the community in a person-to-person -person way, which leads to the spread of a respiratory-borne illness. So point number one, there's an increased incidence of infection. Point number two, once infected, there's a predisposition to get severe COVID-19 disease. And why is that? It's because there's an increased incidence and prevalence of the comorbidities 
that are associated with severe COVID-19 disease that lead to the increased situation where you're more likely going to be seriously ill, hospitalized, intensive care, and death. So it's really what I would refer to the common colloquial language of a double whammy against black and brown people. And the data show this to be true. Take a look at this, which is the rate of hospitalizations per 100,000 people, comparing black, brown, Native Americans to white non-Hispanics. The extraordinary difference in hospitalizations per 100,000 people. Taking black alone, 564 per 100,000 compared to whites, 184. When one looks at the deaths of these individuals, 132 per 100,000 compared to 81 among whites. Again, an extraordinary disparity for the reasons that I mentioned. Now, the NIH research on coronavirus is divided into multiple components, therapeutics, diagnostics, natural history, basic research. The one we're gonna talk about today, importantly, is vaccines. And I'm gonna tell you a little story about how this occurred and why we have the vaccines that we have right now. It has to do with the history of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease Vaccine Research Center. Way back, and Dr. Wynn had mentioned during my years, which I still am very much involved with, with HIV AIDS, in December of 1996, President Clinton and Vice President Gore invited me to the White House to discuss AIDS research. And here I am in the Oval Office discussing this with then President Bill Clinton. And in the discussion, he asked why we didn't have a vaccine. And I explained, we really needed a vaccine research center where investigators from multiple disciplines, basic researchers, clinical researchers, people who understand immunology, virology, structural biology could all work together. And to his great credit, he listened to me. And when he was giving a commencement address only five months later, at Morgan State in Baltimore, he said, today I'm pleased to announce that the NIH will establish a new AIDS vaccine research center dedicated to this crusade. So what I did, I, I recruited from all over the country, the very best people representing every single discipline that's important in the development of vaccines from basic research to clinical trials. One of them is the person in the upper left-hand corner named Dr. Barney Graham. But he was interested in a bunch of other diseases. And because of the fact that they were so good at what they did, they began making vaccines for a variety of other diseases, including, as shown on this yellow highlight, coronaviruses, which is the virus that is now causing COVID-19. Now, there's Barney Graham now. I want people to understand that one of the important scientists who was a student of Dr. Graham, Kismekia or Kizzy Corbett, was one of the people involved in the development of a very important component of the Moderna, Pfizer, and other vaccines. And that is shown here on the right-hand side is that spike protein, which gives the virus on the left the light blue spikes sticking out, which gives it the appearance of a crown. And that's the reason why we call it coronavirus, because corona means crown. But it is an understanding how one can immunize people with that spike protein that allows us to have the successful vaccines we have now. We at NIH have taken a strategic approach by either developing, as I mentioned just a moment ago, or facilitating the testing of a group, six in number, of vaccines that we hope will ultimately be successful in protecting people against SARS-CoV-2. We did that through an organization called Operation Warp Speed, which is a collaboration between the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Defense. 
at HHS, it's NIH, my group, the CDC, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development uh, Agency, and the Assistant Secretary for Prevention and Response. And what we did is that we harmonized the protocols so that the endpoints were the same, the clinical trial units collaborated, the assays were the same, the people who judged the safety and the efficacy, which we called the Data and Safety Monitoring Board, was common, and the statistical plan was common. These are the vaccines that you're reading about in the newspapers every day. The ones that are the furthest advance are the mRNA done by Moderna and Pfizer, and I'll get back to that in a moment. The others are ones that are lined up now, and you'll hear about them soon, probably within the next couple of weeks. The Johnson & Johnson or Janssen, AstraZeneca, Novavax or Sanofi. The one that is out there now that we're vaccinating people with is the messenger RNA vaccine approach. People ask, mRNA, is this going to interfere with my genes? Absolutely not. What it is, it's an mRNA, which is a, um, a genetic component that codes for or instructs the body to make certain proteins. And in this case, the protein is that spike protein that you want the body to make an immune response against. So you inject someone with that in a very safe way, the body starts pumping out these proteins, your immune system recognizes the protein, and you make a very nice immune response. And in fact, the two companies, Pfizer and Moderna, that are using this mRNA, which was tested in 30,000 people in the Moderna trial and 44,000 people in the Pfizer trial, and it was shown to be safe and extraordinarily effective, 94 to 95% to protect you against any form of clinical disease and almost 100% in protecting you against severe disease. Now the vaccine needs to be distributed. And that's exactly what we're doing now. There've been some bumps in the road on the way, but we can talk about that during the question period but the distribution is according to priorities. The phase one by healthcare personnel and those in long-term care facilities, namely nursing homes, then frontline essential workers, and then the elderly, people 75 years of age or older, then individuals who are somewhat younger but still within the elderly group, and those with high-risk conditions and other essential workers. We hope by the time we get to April, we'll be able to have what we call open season, namely anybody, even if you're not in a priority group, can wind up getting vaccinated, hopefully even sooner than that. Now, one of the things we want to mention is that there's a degree of skepticism, understandable skepticism among the brown and black community, because history tells us they have not always been treated fairly and ethically by the federal government in their medical approaches. That's the past, a shameful past that we have to live with, but there are now safeguards in place that will never let that happen again. So you see on this chart, how many among brown and black people are skeptical about the vaccine. And that's the reason why I and my colleagues are out there to talk about the process of how this is clearly a safe and effective vaccine which I have enough confidence in that I myself, as some of you may know, was vaccinated publicly to show the case. And here is soon to be President Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, soon to be Vice President, being vaccinated. And there I am in the middle panel getting vaccinated at NIH uh, about a week and a half ago together with Francis Collins, the director of NIH, and HH Secretary Alex Azar. Now, I want to close by making one comment. We want you all to get vaccinated for your own protection, for that of your family, and for your community. However, we must remember that this is not a substitute because until we get the overwhelming majority of the population in this country, and I would say 70 to 85 percent, 
to get good herd immunity, there still will be the danger lurking in the community about transmitting viruses. And for that reason, we need to continue to adhere to public health measures until we get this outbreak completely crushed, which I believe is entirely feasible in the context of 2021, likely towards the end of the year, but I believe strongly that we can do it. And finally, for those of you wanting more information about the vaccine and about how you might actually volunteer for other vaccine trials, you can just go to this link, coronaviruspreventionnetwork.org. But if you want to find out about the vaccine that's available, easy to do, just go to the CDC website, cdc.gov. So I'll stop there and be very happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fauci. Um, yeah, that was actually wonderful. You can't see it, but the number of amens just popped up uh, on the screen and on my cell phone. So I just wanna let you know that uh, you, you got a lot of amens out there. Um, we do have one question uh, just to kick things off. Um, and this question is really directed at you specifically. It says, how are you taking care of yourself given that you've been under unremitting stress for the past 12 months? It says, you, do you need a couple prayers? <laughs> well, I tell you, I, I need a lot of prayers. So if you got some to spare, send them, send them on my behalf, please. Uh, no, actually, this has been an extraordinary year. Uh, I, I really literally, without hyperbole, haven't had a day off since last January. So it's been a year, but it's important. I don't mean anybody to feel sorry for me. It's an important thing. Uh, we, we, we have so much at stake, which the health and the life and the safety of the American public, that until we get this really under control, then I, I'm not gonna rest and I promise you that. What I do is I try as best as I can to um, get, you know, I don't get enough rest, but I exercise. So I think running has been my savior. I'm a former marathon runner, a former 10K runner. So right now I use that to relieve the stress of this job. But I wouldn't mind some prayers along the way. So please go ahead and do it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. The next question is, what specific steps do you believe churches or other houses of worship in general can and should take to promote vaccines and otherwise help stop the spread of COVID? And one, one uh, follow-up to that was, um, do you think it would be wise or helpful if uh, some of these houses of worship were partnered in a way in which they could even you know, open up their churches uh, to help deliver some of the vaccines? Yeah, those are two great questions. Well, what we need to do, and this is absolutely critical, if we wanna crush this outbreak, we've gotta get the overwhelming majority of the United States population to get vaccinated, including, and I might say, even specifically black and brown people because of the risk that I showed you on some of those slides. And that was the reason I showed those slides because of the increased risk of infection and serious deleterious consequences. So what black churches, places of faith in black and brown areas should do, since you do have an air of authority, you are trusted. You are trusted so much more than the outside non-brown black world. So when you get up there and say to your brethren and your brothers and sisters who come to your churches that it's important for you to get vaccinated, that means an awful lot. And they will say, well, we, you know, we have skepticism about that. And you ask, well, what, what is the issue? Well, we think it went too fast. And I think as the governor said, and you may have said, Rob, that speed was related to extraordinarily breathtaking scientific advances in vaccine platform technologies that allowed us to do in months what normally would have taken years. So the next question people ask is, well, is it really safe and effective? I don't really trust the government. They may be just trying to put something over on us and the drug companies are just trying to make a lot of money. So why should I trust them? Well, there's an answer to that skepticism. 
And that is that the decision as to whether or not this is a safe and effective vaccine was made by an independent body that is beholden not to the government, not to the company, but to the American public. It's called the Data and Safety Monitoring Board. And they decided that the data was striking 94 and 95% efficacious in preventing clinical disease. The FDA makes the final decision as to whether it's safe and effective enough to go out to the general public. And here again, career scientists, not politicians, they together with a totally independent advisory committee then makes the recommendation whether the vaccine should go out to the general public. And they made that recommendation. So when you get up there in the church and talk to your brethren, you should be saying that the process was both independent and transparent. And that's the reason why you need to get vaccinated. Thank you for that. Um, we have one other question that, that, that just came in about how confident are you that this vaccine will be effective given the news that we hear from the United Kingdom and England about countering the new variants? That's a very good question that a lot of people are asking. And right now, the scientists in the UK have taken a close look at this and have determined that the antibodies that are induced by the vaccine that we're using now are still very effective against the mutant strain. We will also be looking at that very carefully and following it carefully. And if anything changes, then we will be able to make a modification in the vaccine. But right now, the data indicate that the UK mutant is still quite sensitive to the antibodies that are induced by the vaccine. But again, we're gonna be very careful. We're gonna continue to follow that to make sure that it stays that way. Got it. Um, we have a great question about um, given the fact that you've shown yourself and others who've taken the vaccine, what side effects did you have and what side effects could you tell people to tell their congregation or people in the community to potentially expect? Okay, so the side effects of the vaccine and the first dose are generally mild and the typical kind of side effects you get when you get a flu shot or any other of the shots that you get. You get a little bit of an ache in the arm, which I got. It lasted about, it, it, first of all, I didn't feel it until maybe six to 10 hours after. I got vaccinated in the morning, 